Kari von Skolkvig, who will be our MC this evening. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to Kari. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Thanks. <laughs> I'll send up the. Which part did you like to take it? Oh, sorry, that time I was talking about. Ah, look at that. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, you'll see in the side pocket of your baggie, there's a little booklet with a, yeah, with a, the agenda and an abstract, and then also bios of our two speakers. I'm not going to read that. You can do that at your own leisure. So um, I'll only briefly say why we invited these two guys. Um, so Lee, of course, doesn't need introduction at Sesima. He's been collaborating with us for a very long time, supervised some students, including moi. So, and then he will definitely still be involved in Sesima for long. Jeff is not so long-standing collaboration, but we have a very concrete thing that we are working on together. Um, and I'll tell you the longer version of what we're working on together and um, why Jeff is also here. So um, I'll I have a few slides. I'll just go through it very briefly. So um, since you're all here on World World AIDS Day, I'm sure you don't need introduction to who UN AIDS is, but just briefly, um, UN AIDS leads the global effort um, to end AIDS as a public health by 2030 with the vision of no new HIV infections, no um, AIDS deaths, um, and then zero discrimination. And they're really walking the talk, they're doing lots of advocacy, um, um, money raising, etc. and of importance tonight, they generate strategic information and analysis that increases the understanding of the state of the AIDS epidemic and progress made at the regional national and global level. So, level. so back to the boogie, for example, these um, we've got all these um, cute things from the UNAIDS website. They made these downloadable things for, for World AIDS Day. And these numbers, for example, um, are also model estimates that UNAIDS generates. Um, and for example, this as well. Globally, 1.5 million people were nearly infected with HIV in 2021, um, um, and so on. And so now you think, um, how do they come up with these numbers? And the answer is with the help of the UNAIDS reference group on estimates, modeling, and projections. This group was formed in 97 with a secretariat established in 1999 to formalize and streamline its operations. It's an open code of modelers, epidemiologists, demographers, statisticians, and public health experts. Um, some of these people volunteer their time, um, some academics. Some are paid by UNAIDS to build and maintain the models, and some are employed by other stakeholders, such as ministries of health, CDC, PEPFAR, and other UN agencies. Um, Mathematical methods developed with the guidance of the reference group are used by UNAIDS to generate HIV estimates for nearly every country in the world. So 172 out of 194 UN countries representing 99% of the world's population. Um, the reference group seeks to balance practicality and scientific rigor to make recommendations based on the best available evidence. And um, it's a very transparent process. Um, and it aims to allow the stats and reports published by UNAIDS to be informed by impartial scientific peer review. So I'm quickly going to go over to the new website of the reference group. It's the first time I'm seeing it on a big screen, so the rations <laughs> look a bit weird. It's very new. Um, so 
Since early this year, SESIMA hosts the Secretariat of the Reference Group. Um, we organize uh, meetings. Um, we summarize and disseminate recommendations um, made by the reference group. And most importantly, um, led by Jeff and Lee, we come up with an agenda and objectives for the reference group to keep reviewing the current modeling approaches and identify data needs. Um, so, hmm. not, I said I will be able to do this and then I thought, oh, there we go. Why you need a mouse? Oh, damn it. I wanted to show up all our pretty faces on the website. <laughs> it's not happening. Um, so, yeah, uh, essentially, Jeff and Lee are two critical spokes in the UNAIDS HIV estimates wheel, and um, we are very honored to have them here today. Um, Faika is in charge of the online people. So, just say hi, Faika. Um, so, we will have their presentations and then we'll have um, about 15 minutes of questions and answers. So over to Lee. I'm very excited about his talk. There are pink feather bowers in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lee, I think you can just, there we go. I'll just go down. Okay. Thanks, Kari, for the introduction, and thanks very much for the invitation to give this World AIDS Day lecture. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the South African AIDS epidemic, and Jeff will follow with more global perspectives on the AIDS epidemic. So as an epidemiologist, I often struggle to explain to people what I do. Um, last year, someone asked me, what do you do? And I started out by explaining that I developed these computer models to make predictions of what the future course of the epidemic is going to be for various infectious diseases. And this guy responded by, with a, a, an interesting observation. He said, oh, so you're like one of the psychohistorians in the foundation. So for those of you who haven't heard of the foundation, the foundation is a classic of science fiction uh, written by Isaac Asimov back in the 1950s um, and recently turned into a TV series on Apple TV. It tells the story of a mathematician called Harry Selden, who develops a mathematical theory called psychohistory, which can be used to predict the future. And psychotheory basically combines the study of history and human psychology uh, within the mathematical modeling framework in order to make predictions about what events can happen in the future. The idea is not to predict individual actions, but rather to predict broad social trends. So Harry Seldon's model predicts the imminent collapse of the galactic empire. Uh, his model predicts that the universe is entering a dark age in which there will be continuous warfare and disorder, which will persist for the next 30,000 years. He realizes that it's too late to prevent the collapse of the galactic empire, but his model also predicts that if a scientific foundation is established, which can preserve current scientific knowledge, the duration of this dark age will be reduced from 30,000 years to just 1,000 years. And so begins his efforts to establish the foundation. So the work that Jeff and I do is a little bit like <laughs> the work of Harry Seldon. We are also in the business of developing mathematical models to predict the future based on studying past trends. Um, we are obviously concerned mostly with predicting HIV trends, uh, but in order to make these predictions, we often have to look at other types of social trends. So we have to look at demographic data, uh, socioeconomic data. And so um, a lot of this predictive modeling incorporates various types of data. Um, where our modeling differs a bit from Harry Seldon's modeling is that we would never be so brave as to predict 30,000 years into the future. Uh, very often we have difficulty predicting with any confidence more than 10 years into the future. 
Um, but this evening we're going to be relatively bold by epidemiological standards and predict much further into the future. So in this slide, we're looking at HIV incidence rates in adults in South Africa. Um, the incidence rate is the rate at which new infections are occurring. So it's a measure of how well we are doing in controlling the spread of HIV. And you can see here that in South Africa, incidence rates peaked in the late 1990s and have stood, since then been steadily declining, um, initially as a result of condom promotion programs and more recently as a result of increases in HIV testing and the role of, of antiretroviral treatment, or ART. Uh, the blue line is showing you the incidence trend in men, and the red is the incidence trend in women. And you can see that consistently over the last 30 years, incidence rates have been much higher in women than in men. Um, the vertical gray line there is where we are currently in 2022, and you can see that uh, we're predicting that over the next two decades, we can expect to see a continued decline in incidence if current programs continue as they have. Here we're looking at HIV prevalence, which is the proportion of all people living with HIV. Um, and you can see that in contrast to HIV incidence, which has been steadily declining, HIV prevalence has been steadily increasing. And this is because once people acquire HIV, they can live with HIV for a very long time, especially now that antiretroviral treatment is widely available. Uh, and this means that there's a long delay between when incidence peaks and when HIV prevalence peaks. Uh, you can see that only now in 2020 are we close to the peak in HIV prevalence, and we expect prevalence to decline uh, gradually over the next two decades. Uh, prevalence in South Africa currently is around 18% in adults. In other words, almost one in every five South Africans uh, is living with HIV. And that is equivalent to about 8 million people living with HIV, which makes South Africa the country with the largest HIV epidemic in the world. Um, South Africa alone accounts for more than 20% of the world's HIV infections. Here we're looking at how the age distribution of HIV has changed over time. So you can see that in the early stages of the HIV epidemic, a lot of the uh, people living with HIV were youth in light blue and children in dark blue. Um, but you can see that over the last 10 years, the numbers of new infections, uh, or sorry, new infections, the number of people living with HIV at those younger ages has been steadily declining. And in contrast, the number of people living with HIV at older ages in red um, has been increasing. By 2040, we expect that about 60% of all people living with HIV in South Africa will be over the age of 50. And this is not because older people are acquiring HIV at a higher rate, it's because the people who acquired HIV in their youth are surviving to older ages than they would have in the absence of treatment. The model that we've been using to produce these estimates is the Temisa model. Um, this model produces estimates at both the national level and at, at a provincial level. And here we're looking at some of the provincial differences in HIV prevalence in South Africa. Um, you can see here huge heterogeneity within South Africa in HIV prevalence. Mm -hmm. Over the last um, 30 years, HIV prevalence has been consistently highest in Kazoo and Natal in dark red, and lowest in Western Cape in, in dark green. Um, but you can also see the provinces are on quite different trajectories. So, for example, we expect to see quite steep declines in HIV prevalence in KZN and provinces like Gauteng and Mauv, whereas um, in provinces like Western Cape and Eastern Cape and Dark Blue, the prevalence declines are expected to be more gradual. So coming back to the story of the foundation. The foundation is established on a very obscure distant planet called Terminus, which is on the outer edge of the galaxy. And it seems like a very um, unobvious place you know, where to locate the, the, um, this new scientific foundation. Um, it doesn't have any natural resources. Uh, it's very far away from everyone else. But actually, it turns out that it's precisely because of its obscurity that it escapes the attention of the competing warlords as the galactic empire collapses. Um, and it's because of its lack of natural resources that its scientists and engineers are forced to innovate and develop new technologies far superior to those anywhere else in the galaxy. Um, and so the story of the establishment of the foundation really becomes a story of uh, finding hope in dark times um, and about realizing that sometimes less can be more. 
Um, and reading the story of the foundation really resonated with me for, for several reasons. Um, I think firstly, because as a South African, we, we similarly perceive ourselves to be on the outer edge of the universe sometimes. And we often make the mistake of thinking that we have to leave South Africa in order to achieve anything of significance. Um, but also, I think more importantly, it resonated with me um, because of the theme of finding hope in dark times, which really took me back to when I started working in the field of HIV in the early 2000s. At that time, there was no ART available in South Africa, at least not in the public sector. Um, and to make matters worse, our president at the time, Tabo Mbeki, was in complete denial about the AIDS epidemic. Um, Tabo Mbeki and Health Minister Manta Chabalala and Simang were ideologically opposed to ART and were promoting various alternative uh, treatments which were not scientifically proven. In this slide, we're looking at changes over time in annual numbers of AIDS deaths. Um, and the red line is showing you what we predict would have happened if there'd been no ART program in South Africa. In that scenario, we would have expected AIDS deaths to peak at around about 450,000 deaths per annum in recent years. Um, and to put that into perspective, that would have implied about roughly half of all deaths in South Africa being due to AIDS. In contrast, the blue line is showing you what has actually happened. And you can see there's been a very dramatic drop in AIDS mortality since the start of the ART program. Um, we're now down to about 50,000 AIDS deaths per annum which is still too much, but I think when you stop to think about it, this is a really, um, it, it's a miracle that we've achieved this reduction in AIDS mortality, despite the denialism that existed in the early 2000s. This next slide gives you a sense of how we achieved those reductions in AIDS mortality. Here we're looking at changes over time, in engagement in HIV care. So the different colors are representing different um, the proportions of people living with HIV in different stages of disease. So green is representing people who are undiagnosed. And you can see that in, in the early 2000s, it was those undiagnosed individuals who accounted for the bulk of people living with HIV. The yellow is representing people who've been diagnosed but not started ART. You can see that in the early 2010s, that delay between diagnosis and treatment initiation is the biggest, um, the biggest um, bottleneck in the system. The orange is representing people who uh, started ART but um, are currently interrupting treatment. The red is people who are on treatment but not virally suppressed. And then the dark red is people who are on treatment and virally suppressed. So ideally, we would want everyone who's living with HIV to be in that dark red. Currently, in 2022, we have only about 65% of people in that dark red. Um, and you can see that currently the biggest obstacle to us getting to everyone on treatment and virally suppressed is actually high rates of treatment uh, interruption in South Africa, as represented by the orange. I mentioned that we are seeing an, an, an aging of the AIDS epidemic, and you can see that here too when we look at the, the age distribution of the AIDS deaths. Um, here you can see that when AIDS mortality in South Africa peaked around 2005, a lot of the deaths were in um, children in dark green and adults under the age of 35 in lighter shades of green. Um, but those deaths in young adults and children have dropped off very dramatically over the last um, 15 years. Um, whereas we're seeing slightly increasing numbers of AIDS deaths in older adults, particularly in the 60 plus age category. And again, this is because of increased survival to those older ages. Um, most of these people would not have uh, lived to age 60 in the absence of antiretroviral treatment. So I think we are seeing a, a, sh a slow shift from AIDS as a disease that affected mostly young people to AIDS as a disease of the elderly. It's so coming back to the story of the foundation. Um, during the first 200 years or so of the foundation, uh, Harry Seldon's model proves to be remarkably accurate. The galactic empire collapses, as the model had predicted, and the newly established foundation goes through a series of crises, each of which was predicted by the model. But then a crisis occurs which was not predicted by the model. A man with a rare genetic mutation develops the ability to apply people, uh, control people's emotions, and that sets him on a path to overthrow the foundation. And 
The model really fails to predict this event because it's a model that predicts broad social trends. It's not capable of predicting individual mutations that have the potential to change the course of history. Um, and if you speak to anyone who's been working in predictive modeling, they'll be able to tell you similar stories about how models have failed. Many of us have been humbled at seeing our models um, failing or not predicting things correctly. Um, I think for me personally, one of the biggest, uh, one of the most humbling experiences was realizing that the model um, of sexual behavior and sexual transmission of HIV that I had developed for South Africa was really not an accurate description at all of what was going on. So when I started working in the field of HIV modeling, I was working with a class of models called frequency dependent deterministic models. Um, like Harry Seldon's models, these models are concerned with describing average patterns of behavior in different subpopulations, but not really capturing individual level differences um, and not linking individuals in sexual relationships. Um, Agent-based models or network models, um, on the other hand, simulate each individual in the population as a separate unit. And that allows us to represent uh, much more diversity and complexity than what we can capture in standard deterministic frequency dependent models. So we did a study to compare um, two models of HIV and other sexually transmitted infections or STIs. Um, these two models were identical in structure. Um, they were uh, both calibrated to the exact same HIV and STI prevalence data in South Africa. The only difference between these two models was that the one was a network or um, agent-based model, and the other was a frequency-dependent deterministic model. Um, and this is just an illustration of how the transmission processes differ. In the network model on the left-hand side, you can consider two um, hypothetical individuals in a couple, um, person A and person B. If person A is infected, they transmit their infection to person B. The relationship between A and B ends, B then forms a new relationship with C, and B transmits their infection to C. Um, the important point to note here is there is a delay between when person B becomes infected and when person B can transmit their infection to C. In contrast, in the frequency-dependent model on the right-hand side, uh, person B is exposed to an average risk of infection um, and immediately after becoming infected, they can start transmitting infection back to that risk pool. So it's as if there's no delay between when infection occurs and when transmission can occur. Um, and this is obviously not realistic. Um, and it turns out that those delays between when infection occurs and when transmission occurs are quite crucial in STI and HIV epidemiology. Here, for example, we're looking at um, comparing these two models in terms of the predicted reduction in STI incidence if there were to be a 50% reduction in unprotected sex and spousal relationships. Um, the blue, sorry, the purple bars are showing you what we would predict if we were using the, the frequency dependent model. The green bars are showing you what we would predict if we were using the network model. And you can see that for all of the STIs except for herpes, um, the frequency dependent model is expected. Uh, predicting a much greater uh, reduction in STI incidence as a result of this behavior change. In contrast, when we look at the potential effect of a reduction in commercial sex, uh, we see the network model predicts a much greater reduction in, in STI um, incidence. Um, and similarly, when we look at the effect of ending the acquisition of secondary partnerships, the network model is again predicting a much greater reduction in incidence. When we talk about um, ending acquisition of secondary partners, we're referring to a hypothetical scenario in which people only have one partner at a time. So there's no concurrent partnerships. Um, and you can see from the slide that those concurrent partnerships are contributing very substantially to the spread of HIV and other STIs. So I think the main lesson we learned from this model comparison study was that uh, frequency dependent models are actually quite problematic in terms of the way they characterize sexual transmission of HIV and other STIs. Um, they tend to overstate the importance of low-risk groups like married couples, while they understate the importance of high-risk behaviors like concurrent partnerships and commercial sex. And it's really because they don't capture those delays between um, acquisition of infection and um, potential to transmit infection to new sexual partners, um, that they don't get that dynamic right. 
Um, we've also seen that concurrent partnerships and commercial sex are critically important to the spread of HIV and other STIs. Um, and really, we need, to, we need to go beyond just enumerating these high-risk behaviors, and we need to think about what are the structural drivers of these high-risk behaviors and what can we do to um, influence those social determinants of risk behavior. Um, and to that end, we've recently been doing work on extending our network model to consider two important um, social determinants of, of high-risk behavior, namely inequitable gender norms and binge drinking. So this slide is showing you how we've changed the model structure to incorporate um, these new dynamics. Um, there have been several studies showing that um, men who endorse inequitable gender norms um, typically have more multiple and concurrent partnerships, uh, are more likely to engage in transactional sex, um, and less likely to use uh, condoms consistently. They also engage in more binge drinking. Um, and studies have also shown that binge drinking is strongly associated with transactional sex and consistent condom use. Um, so we've extended the model to incorporate these dynamics, and we've also allowed for the impact of alcohol counseling interventions um, and gender transformative interventions, which are interventions that seek to change uh, gender norms. Uh, here we're looking at the predicted um, outputs of this model. This is showing you the fraction of new HIV and STI cases attributable to binge drinking and inequitable gender norms over the last two decades. You can see that um, on the left-hand side, binge drinking is estimated to account for about 8% of all HIV transmission, and inequitable gender norms account for about 22% of transmission. Uh, and we get similar estimates by the STIs on the right-hand side. So these results are significant because they suggest that there's a further opportunity to reduce HIV incidence by focusing on the social drivers of high-risk behaviors. Um, and so alcohol interventions and gender transformative interventions as examples um, really need to be given uh, more emphasis. Uh, and we should not be focusing only on the sort of biomedical interventions that have been the main state of HIV prevention up to now. So I'm now going to hand over to Jeff and we will take questions at the end. Great. Um, thanks very much uh, for the invitation today. Um, I'm going to talk about some reflections on modeling, modelers, and future priorities, and regretfully a bit less uh, Asimov. Um, it's a huge honor to share the podium with Lee today. Much like Kari, Lee's been very influential for me. When I was a, Lee was a PhD student and I was an undergraduate, Lee came on a visit to Seattle and was the first person that exposed me to many of the wide classes of model that he's talked about today. Um, it's also a huge honor to be back at SESIMA today. The very first academic conference I ever uh, attended was the TB and HIV modeling conference hosted at SESIMA in 2006. And again, um, this is the photo with me tucked away in the back. And that was um, tremendously exciting uh, as a young researcher to come together and hear about this wide world of, of HIV modeling. So um, a big thanks to SESIMA for hosting me in 2006 and for, for hosting me back again today. Uh, so I said I'd, I'd, I'd give a slightly more global view of, of the HIV epidemic and it's starting with some of the UNAIDS estimates that um, Kari has also tucked into your, your, your goodie bags in the cards. Uh, but overall, uh, UNAIDS estimate at the end of 2021 that there were 38 million people living with HIV globally, 1.5 million new infections, and 650,000 AIDS deaths in 2020, sorry, 2021. Um, HIV is, uh, of course, South Eastern and sub Southern Africa are disproportionately affected by HIV with around 21 million of the 38 million people living with HIV globally residing in uh, Eastern and Southern Africa, another 5 million in Western and Central Africa. The overall trend in the HIV epidemic has globally, much like South Africa, globally has been a steady increase in the estimated number of people living with HIV, a rapid increase during the 1990s, but then a slower but steady increase since then. However, underpinning that um, increase in the overall number of people living with HIV 
are two generally good news stories. Globally, the, the number of new HIV infections has been steadily declining since around 1997, and the number of AIDS deaths globally has been falling since 2004, following the um, effective scale of, of antiretroviral treatments. So the increased number of people living with HIV is really a reflection of slowing new infections, but uh, a far reduced number of, of AIDS deaths. And the impact of these reductions have been the largest in the Eastern and Southern Africa region. So the regions, the most burdened region has also seen um, the, the largest turnaround in the epidemic. Um, this shows the, on the left, the HIV incidence per thousand, there's been a 58% reduction in HIV incidence in the past decade since 2010. And very similarly, uh, a very, very sharp decline in deaths uh, in the late 2000s, and yet a, a further 56% reduction in AIDS deaths in Eastern and Southern Africa since 2010. And both of these trends over the past decade have really been underpinned by this massively um, successful scale of antiretroviral treatment in the region over the past decade, from around 4.5 million people uh, receiving treatment in Eastern and Southern Africa in 2010, to uh, nearly 15 million people receiving treatment at the end of 2021. So more than a threefold increase in the number of people receiving treatment. And I think this has really been one of the largest public health successes, um, certainly uh, in our lifetime and for perhaps um, in, in the world. I wanted to reflect a bit on how we got to this um, tremendous success over the past decade and go back again to 2008, which was around this time that I started to become engaged in HIV research. And 2008, um, it was just after uh, the establishment of, or a few years after the establishment of PEPFAR, um, WHO had established a three by five initiative with an aim to get uh, 3 million people on treatment by 2005. That was missed, but was reached about a year late in 2006. But on the other hand, ART eligibility was restricted only to the sickest people with low CD4 counts. And further to that, there were severe access barriers remaining in uh, much of the world. There was also um, kind of an emerging sense of pessimism due to a series of unsuccessful biomedical HIV prevention trials, microbicide trials, vaccine trials, and there was some evidence of stalling HIV incidence declines um, in places in the region. For example, Uganda, there were clear evidences that following very rapid declines, uh, new infections were, were, were leveling off and stabilizing, which was cause for concern. So I think in the HIV world, there was a bit of a, a worry around this time about what comes next, what can we do? And in 2009, Ruben Granich and colleagues published um, a very provocative paper suggesting a radically new strategy. Instead of um, retaining or, uh, or, or uh, waiting to initiate treatment until people reach advanced HIV uh, disease, proposing strategy of annual HIV testing of the entire population with immediate treatment in order to rapidly reduce HIV uh, prevention. And I think this is another area where Sassima has been very influential. Brian Williams, uh, who was of course here at the time, was um, what, one of the, the, the major proponents and advocates of this strategy at the time. This um, was followed on a year later by results from the HPTN 052 uh, trial that demonstrated unequivocally that uh, HIV uh, treatment and viral suppression uh, uh, eliminated HIV transmission and further um, further promoted this idea of treatment as prevention or gave us the scientific evidence basis for treatment as prevention. And this was named as the breakthrough of the year by Science Magazine in 2011, uh, catalyzing further um, interest and excitement in this strategy. That interesting excitement was met by mathematical modelers. Um, there was, uh, following this, a large number of modeling groups explored different aspects of this question, looked to see if the results were reproduced in different models. And um, one of the activities that we did in one of the first activities um, of the HIV Modeling Consortium in 2011 was to convene, again, a meeting here at SESIMA um, to bring all of the modelers together who modeled HIV treatment as prevention and look to see if these results were consistent across different models um, and if there was general consensus about what the potential impact of this would have. And we found that over short time horizons, there was indeed quite a lot of consistency across models when they model the same intervention strategies and scenarios. 
following this and, and, and the, um, the idea that treatment not only would prevent uh, disease and AIDS death, but treatment was also a powerful prevention tool. In 2014, UNAIDS established the 90-90-90 targets, which I think uh, have been, um, uh, well, we're, we're going to see, uh, were tremend a tremendously successful advocacy tool. And around the same time, WHO started considering not only the impacts and benefits of treatment for preventing uh, disease and AIDS death, but also treatment as prevention as part of the considerations around changing the um, changing the eligibility thresholds to, to make people with um, HIV eligible for treatment somewhat earlier. So this is uh, further work that the HIV Modeling Consortium did, again, bringing together a group of 12 um, different mathematical models to look at what the impact cost and cost effectiveness would be of earlier ART eligibility, as well as substantial expansions and access to um, ART. So we conceptualized earlier ART eligibility simply as taking people who are already diagnosed and in care and initiating them on treatment, um, either high to CD4 counts or immediately. Um, uh, and then the expansion and access, but that would only reach the people who were um, already had been diagnosed and in care. And expanded access we considered as a hypothetical scenario of what if programs were, HME programs were additionally able to go out and find and reach and pull into care all of the undiagnosed or unlinked people and initiate them on treatment immediately when guidelines suggested. So we modeled that scenario because, again, it was a policy and advocacy interest. But I think behind the scenes or around the, the coffee table discussions at the meetings, many mathematical modelers were thinking at the time, well, the changes to HIV programs that would have to occur to actually make this expanded access scenario a reality are completely infeasible given the current functioning of HIV programs and, and health systems in the region. And so we modeled these scenarios, but I think um, several years on, uh, at least personally, I and I think others have said, we didn't necessarily expect them to come to pass. And so this chart shows um, what happened next. This is the number of HIV tests per year amongst adults in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we see that following the establishment of the 90-90-90 targets and the momentum uh, that built and the consensus that built around treatment as prevention as a strategy, this catalyzed a transformative, um, uh, a real transformation to HIV programs. Between uh, 2014 and 2018, the number of HIV tests conducted annually doubled, uh, really with the sole purpose of striving to reach the 90-90-90 targets. This had impact. This is uh, an analysis of HIV uh, testing data um, conducted across all 42 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, this is a paper led by Katia Jaguer from McGill University, where we estimated that looking back at the HIV testing uh, data over um, the, the past uh, 20 years, uh, Eastern and Southern Africa had reached um, around 80% awareness of status by, um, by 2020 somewhat higher uh, awareness of status in women than men. And estimated that by 2020, uh, 12 countries in Eastern and Southern Africa had attained the first 90 target of 90% awareness of HIV status by 2020, including uh, the region of Southern Africa. And indeed, this massive scale up of, of testing achieved that crucial goal of not only diagnosing uh, people um, who were at risk of AIDS, but also diagnosing and linking people to care early enough um, to prevent onward transmission. So in Eastern Southern Africa, the median time from infection to, uh, to diagnosis reduced from around eight, um, around eight years in the early 2000s to uh, a year and a half, uh, around a year and a half by 2020. And we're now really seeing the massive impacts of this. I'm just highlighting here uh, evidence from the, the most recent household survey in Botswana, which has been one of the most successful programs, where not only did they reach the 90-90-90 targets by 2020, but by 2021, they've now reached and surpassed the new 95-95-95 targets that have been set for 2025. So now in Botswana, at the end of 2021, from household survey data, 95% of people with HIV are diagnosed, 98% of those people are on treatment, and 98% of those are virally, virally suppressed, just, I, th I think, just 
simply unimaginable results um, from sitting here a, a decade ago, considering what the impact of treatment intervention can be. In terms of impact, there's estimates of HIV incidence trends, et cetera, et cetera, from Botswana. For me, I find looking at what the experience of people around my age, a cohort before me and a cohort after me have experienced with the HIV epidemic most compelling. And the last household survey of Botswana in 2013, around 27% of women aged 25 to 29 um, were living with HIV and 27% of men aged 30 to 34 were living with HIV. In 2021, amongst women aged 25 to 29, that's reduced by around 40% to 16%. And amongst men aged 30 to 30, 34, that's reduced from 27% down to 7% um, over an eight year period, simply reflecting the massive impact um, that treatment as prevention and, and other prevention programs have had um, in Botswana. So now, um, Looking forward, thinking about we're very much in a different context now in the HIV epidemic than we were um, a decade ago. I think the last decade has been characterized by very rapid, focused, massive scale up and expansion of HIV programs. Now, in settings that have achieved 95, 95, 95, where incidence is declining, um, as we showed in South Africa, uh, much everywhere. Um, the focus is starting to shift, and, and this is really underpinned or, or, or outlined in the new global AIDS strategy that was adopted uh, last year. The new global AIDS strategy, strategy really recognizes that as HIV uh, declines, it's most likely to continue affecting the most um, or disproportionately, increasingly disproportionately affect the most marginalized um, and, and the most stress at risk. So really focus on ending inequalities as the next real challenge in the HIV epidemic. And there's also a big focus on using data uh, more effectively to, to guide this. I think there's a quote from the Global AIDS Strategy that especially resonates with me, is recognizing that one size does not fit all. The strategy prioritizes tailoring of differential service packages and service delivery approaches to the unique needs of people, communities, and locations using granular data to focus programs most effectively. I just want to comment a bit on what our ability to use granular data is now in, um, in, in the HIV epidemic, and I think it's um, a bit mixed. One uh, major area of success um, over the past five years has been using detailed spatial um, geographic information to guide HIV programs and, and priorities for HIV programs. We now have uh, granular characterization of HIV burden, treatment coverage, and unmet need for treatment, and the number of new infections by every district across Sub-Saharan Africa. And these data are used by national HIV programs and stakeholders to guide where to prioritize interventions, where, um, where, where additional testing and treatment is, is needed. There's also evidence that high burden locations, uh, much of this evidence coming from Frank, uh, just here um, in, in the front, that these high burden locations are also where the most new infections have occurred. And so this has really driven a focus on, um, on scaling up treatment, testing and treatment programs uh, as a priority in high burden locations. And so from these same data, we can see now five or seven years on what the impact has been, the success of scaling up programs in these high burden locations. You see that in KwaZulu Natal, where HIV prevalence, the districts in KwaZulu Natal, where HIV prevalence is around 30%, in many districts, also has the highest uh, treatment coverage and viral suppression, um, near, very near uh, reaching the 90-90 targets, 90-90-90 uh, targets in KwaZulu Natal. On the other hand, in Western Cape and Northern Cape, which have a much lower uh, prevalence of HIV. Treatment programs are also lagging substantially behind with only around 60 to 65 percent of people living with HIV, um, HIV receiving treatment. And so this uh, really highlights the dynamic of, firstly, the success that the prioritization program has had, but also the risk of emerging and perpetuating inequalities. Um, and, and we can use these granular data to help um, uh, to help right size that. On the other hand, while we've been very successful at um, targeting and prioritizing interventions based on geographic, detailed geographic data, I think that our ability to identify exactly who is at risk and micro-target prevention is somewhat more challenged uh, with current evidence. Uh, there's been a great deal of work over the past decades to uh, identify HIV 
uh, risk tools to identify who might be most at risk and prioritize prevention, for example, pre-exposure prophylaxis to those most at risk. In a daytime uh, lecture, I might present you some tables of regression coefficients and things, um, but, but but here this evening, I'm just going to show an example of uh, uh, of why this is, has proved challenging using data from the Monique Land Center in eastern Zimbabwe, um, uh, a, a long-running cohort study uh, from our department at Imperial College. So recently, um, colleagues um, looked at an evaluation of a proposed risk tool developed by the WHO and it allocated young women aged 15 to 24 to uh, at-risk um, uh, populations who would be referred for additional or intensified HIV prevention, low-risk women, and women who were not at risk at all based on reporting no sexual activity um, in the past year or, or not yet being sexually active. 17% of adolescent girls and young women were determined at risk, and 40% of the new infections, HIV or HSV2 infections, occurred amongst this at-risk group. On the other hand, a remaining 40% of infections occurred amongst adolescent girls and young women who were not sexually active at the baseline assessment. And so this really highlights uh, the challenge of identifying those who are at risk in the high uh, variability in HIV risk that, that can occur. I think there's also a more fundamental reason about why identifying and prioritizing risk is so hard at the current stage of the epidemic, um, where viral load suppression is high, incidence is reducing, but there's still occasional individuals in the population who are not yet virally suppressed um, that, that, that pose a risk of infection. But we're increasingly getting more evidence about these transmission dynamics from phylogenetic data. And what I'm going to show here is a summary of analysis by the Pangea Consortium, a collaboration of many different studies that are generating uh, phylogenetic data and looking at transmission analysis of not only understanding who's becoming infected, but also able to identify who's transmitting uh, HIV and what those risky uh, partnerships are. I think the results have been um, perhaps somewhat surprising compared to some of the dynamics that we thought are going on, but underpin this diffuseness of risk um, that, that makes it so hard to uh, target HIV prevention. So firstly, 80% of transmissions occur within the same community. So this really strengthens that evidence base for focusing on high burden locations as also high risk locations for HIV incidence. It's also identified that the age group where most HIV transmissions arise from are men aged 25 to 39 years. However, around 75% of HIV transmitters have been infected themselves for more than one year. And so it's not necessarily those people who are recently infected, creating large uh, net out outbreaks of infection, but people who have been infected for, for some time and occasional transmission events arising. And moreover, typical transmission clusters are around two to three individuals. And this is quite different from what we've seen in phylogenetic analyses of other settings, for example, in Europe and the United, United States, where um, transmission clusters of HIV X men who have sex with men are characterized by very large transmission clusters. In Sub-Saharan Africa, um, transmission clusters seem to look quite different, quite small, and therefore perhaps somewhat difficult to, to target. Christoph Fraser, the principal investigator of the Pangea HIV Consortium, has characterized this, I think, really succinctly as now, contemporary HIV transmission is driven by many who infect few, not few who infect many. So what are we left to do given that HIV transmission um, is, is now quite diffuse and quite generalized, um, um, uh, quite rare, but quite diffuse in our, in our settings? Well, one of the things that we noted has emerged really clearly from the phylogenetic analysis is that the um, majority of transmission or the, the, the highest proportion of transmission is arising from men age 25 uh, to 40 years old. This is perhaps only surprising in how predictable it is compared to exactly where we would expect HIV transmissions to occur based on the age groups that have the largest number of people with unsuppressed HIV. And so this has really driven a current focus on um, a priority for preventing HIV is now uh, increasing treatment and viral load suppression amongst these men um, aged 25 to 39 years in order to reduce the risk of onward transmission. So I want to look at um, how that has played out indeed over the story of the South African epidemic that, that Lee described earlier about how the number of men living with HIV 25 to 34 has changed over time. And we see that 
Um, overall, the number of untreated men with HIV, there were around 520,000 untreated men living with HIV, age 25 to 34, in 2015. By 2020, this had halved um, to 260,000 untreated men living with HIV. But if we look at where this has come from, indeed, part of that change has been a successful increase in treatment and, and uh, viral load suppression. But the major impact has been simply men who were not infected in the first place due to the reducing HIV incidence uh, that, that Lee spoke about before. And if we project that forward to 2025, we expect the number of untreated men living with HIV to reduce um, but by uh, half yet again to 136,000, even with no increases in treatment coverage um, or, or approved um, um, testing and linkage in this age group. If we did increase uh, testing and treatment to attain the 90, 90, 90 targets uh, by 25 in this age group, that would result in 71,000 fewer men with viremia. On the other hand, the cumulative impact of voluntary medical male circumcision interventions since 2010 has resulted in 64,000 fewer men with viremia. So we have about the same cumulative impact of uh, male circumcision up till now as we would from reaching 1999. And then if we look at the uh, impact of reduced infections due to ART scale in the incredibly high um, treatment coverage that's been reached amongst women, that's resulted in 240,000 fewer men with viremia um, since 2015. So we see here um, that it's really the cumulative impact of our interventions together that are project protecting the next generation of South Africans. Now, lastly, we're starting to think, what does the future look like and what do the long-term strategies um, what are the, what are the long-term strategies need to look like? And in particular, many people are starting to ask, now that incidence is declining um, uh, relatively rapidly, can we start to scale back some of our programs or when can we start to scale back our programs? So firstly, um, looking at under current epidemiologic and, and program conditions, when will HIV elimination occur defined as less than in, uh, incidence of less than one per thousand? And if we project forward um, up to 2100, with current conditions, we expect HIV elimination to occur around 2055. If we reduce HIV testing in 2025, provider initiated testing by 20%, that would slightly delay when el elimination would occur, but we still uh, are on a strong downward trajectory for new HIV infections. On the other hand, if we reduce uh, testing by 60%, um, in 2025, we would still attain elimination in 2073, but we would be left with a non-zero level, really a new low but endemic equilibrium of HIV in the long term. And if we stopped all provider-initiated testing now, um, we would not attain H we, would, we would still have a downward trajectory in new HIV infections for um, many decades to come, but we wouldn't attain HIV elimination. And so it points to the importance of sustaining our, our, our programs for uh, for the long term. I think the other conclusion is, of course, the only thing we know for certain about the future is that current conditions aren't going to continue, but um, it shows how we can use modeling to game out what some of these future step strategies might look like. And that's the thing to look at next is how other dynamics might affect this. So closing, thinking about some of the reflections on um, how modeling has informed and influenced um, the, the direction of the HIV response in the past decade, I think that we should ask modelers or feel confident asking modelers, what could happen if I do? I think that really the process of mathematical modeling has been very important for thinking through the consequences of future strategies. And largely, um, we've been pretty successful at characterizing and understanding what the potential impact of interventions um, what, uh, could be going forward. On the other hand, reflecting back on the discussions that we had around the coffee table about what was realistically possible, I think we shouldn't ask modelers what is possible to achieve. I think that that's a question much more uh, appropriate for people who are implementing programs, who are uh, creating policy and, and affecting change. And I think as modelers, um, personally, I look back with a bit of humility about, um, about not anticipating what was actually possible over the past decade. I think the other lesson from the past decade of the HIV response that with coordinated and collective action, really incredible things can be achieved. And this is something we can apply across uh, public health, I think. Just reflecting a bit more on what's happened in the past 
a couple of years. During COVID-19, HIV programs demonstrated really exceptional resilience during a period of really acute threat. That came through really concerted effort and really rapid action. And I think that's a story that hasn't been told enough. On the other, time, on the other hand, I think that we do face now a current and somewhat long-term risk of maintaining focus and coordination under kind of a chronic stress of fragmenting priorities in, in global health, economic turmoil and such. And so I think it's really important. I'm not nearly as pessimistic as some of the messaging that's come out, for example, um, um, from, from UNAIDS. I think that really the story of the past two years of COVID-19 has been a period of, uh, has been a demonstration of success and resilience, but it's really important to remain focused on that going forward. Last, I'd like to acknowledge many people who have uh, contributed content for, for this presentation and uh, my wonderful team at Imperial College and our local Arsenal Pub up in Islington. Thanks, me and Jeff. I didn't keep you to talk, but it was really interesting, so I didn't want to. Um, so how shall we do it? Um, In-person questions first. Anyone online? Do we? I don't know if um, this is the best question to start with because nobody else put their hand up. Um, um, so, Lee, I was really interested um, in your comparison between the network model and the frequency and transmission model. Um, and I was interested that you attributed the difference between them primarily to the the delay not being captured because I feel like you can build delays into the frequency-based transmission type models. Um, and so I'm wondering if you've tested that hypothesis on the frequency models that have the delay built in. Because to me, it seems much more like it's about that sort of trickle to everyone versus um, versus risk only to a specific person. Um, so yeah, I'm curious whether yeah. you tested that. So you could, uh, yeah, you could um, allow for some delay between when a person acquires the infection and so we're still considering it. We hadn't in our model. Um, obviously, you would have to make assumptions about what that delay is based on knowledge of gaps between partnerships and how long it takes someone to form a new relationship after they have a relationship with the infection partner. So um, there are additional assumptions that you would require that. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a valid point. We could, we could still potentially get the same dynamics with the deterministic frequency in the model. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, are there any questions online? We do have Brian Williams in the audience. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, the line of mind. The line of mind is. Can you hear me? The, the line of mind is breaking up terribly. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. It's breaking up. You can go ahead, Brian. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but let me ask the question anyway, and I hope you can hear. Um, both presentations are extremely good, and, and uh, I really appreciate them. And I think HIV gives us lots of lessons for other conditions, which are now things we have to deal with, like COVID and other things. The worrying thing is that the incidence is still very high. So we're talking about 50,000 AIDS deaths every year just in South Africa, which is about 7 8% of the total death rate. But it's, you know, I, I think what, what we've done has been incredibly good, but I'm worried that we're reaching a saturation point where we're not going to be able to get it down further. We're not going to be able to stop completely. And we're just going to have to learn to live with it in some way. But I, I'm not sure what. Um, what is your thinking about the long term prospects? I mean, you know, we don't want to go until the end of the century still dealing with AIDS. Yeah, July is starting. Uh, so thanks, Brian, for that observation. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think um, 50,000 AIDS deaths per annum is still way too high. Um, 
I mean, I think there are potential um, new technologies. I'm sure you're aware of the injectable treatment, which will hopefully be, uh, you know, um, will have better adherence associated with it and better viral suppression. Um, and, and new drugs like Dolutoba are also hopefully going to um, lead to better treatment outcomes. Um, but I do think we have this persistent challenge in South Africa around retaining patients in care and um, keeping patients in care is going to be a major challenge for us. Um, I think the prevention piece is also very important. And so um, accelerating HIV prevention is also going to be really critical. Um, I spoke about some of the sort of the structural interventions that we need to consider. Um, but I think also sort of looking at the sort of filling the gaps in our existing programs is going to be really critical to that. Um, what we showed in a recent paper was that about 27% of new infections in South Africa um, are from people who are interrupting treatment. And so addressing the problems in the treatment cascade is really going to be crucial also to reducing HIV incidence. Jeff, do you want to add anything? I think the retention message is, is very clear. Um, I, I I have an amount of optimism um, that the tra trajectory is good, but it does require, I think, especially sustaining um, effective treatment and, and 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 good services. And I do think across many countries there has been a a, a trend towards improving programs over time. And and, and I, I do if you look across countries, there does look to be some trajectory there. So I, I think that's a reason for optimism. Um, but we can't lose sight on how important it is to engage and keep people in treatment. So thank you both for those questions. Can I ask another question? Oh. Um, a much more difficult question. The, the, what has been achieved with HIV has really been quite extraordinary, both in terms of the drug development, the rollout, the social engagement, and all the rest of it. Do we think there are lessons here which can be learned for other conditions which are quite different, like COVID, for example? I mean, the world, this is not going to be the last uh, epidemic disease we see in South Africa. So does the experience of HIV lead us with any long-term lessons for how we should look for, detect, respond to, and deal with other infectious diseases which are bound to come. <laughs> you should respond first. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm almost inclined to turn that over to, you know, for example, Julie, and I, and I think in the, the COVID work in South Africa has, has really come together and been formative. Do you want to comment? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, nobody wants to answer your question. <laughs> okay, they can think about it. <laughs> that HIV did for the COVID pandemic was help decision makers understand how models can help them and how to interpret scenarios. I do think that was a, a big. Um, Impact of the work that's been done in HIV for COVID. Beyond that, I'm not sure. Uh, if I could ask a question as sort of following on from Brian's first point, um, is there any sense that as the infections, the new infections start to come down, dealing with a more and more selective sort of group, and that therefore those kind of transmission? Transmission from other individuals that is consistent to anything. And is that kind of being captured or should be captured in the model? Um, yeah, it's something Chip and I often talk about. So <laughs> I think it's quite controversial. So the one the one thinking is that HIV is becoming more and more concentrated in key populations and that as the epidemic um, as we head towards HIV epidemic elimination, we're going to see sort of generalized epidemics becoming more like concentrated epidemics, at least in the ways in where transmission is clustered. Um, 
we haven't actually seen a lot of evidence of that, though. I mean, I think when you look at some of the key populations like sex workers and MS10, they actually have very high levels of uptake of HIV testing, condom use, and access to prevention. Um, so we, my thinking is that a lot of the incidence is actually going to be concentrated in people who might not be traditionally recognized as high risk uh, or not traditionally recognized as key populations, shall we say. Um, they might not recognize themselves as, as being at risk and, and engaging in high risk behaviors and, and not engaging in HIV services. So I, I would agree with that. That thinking that the HIV is becoming more concentrated in those groups that are more difficult to identify. Um, and I think one of the limitations of our model is that we don't, or not I should say our model, our models collectively is that we don't capture all of those heterogeneities in health seeking behavior and rates of contact with health services. <laughs> so I think there are going to be some people who are very kind of disconnected from exposure to HIV awareness campaigns, HIV prevention campaigns accessing health services um, and it's that heterogeneity and in, in, um, contact with prevention messaging that, that we're not capturing in our models. Um, that's something that, that worries me. Yeah. yeah, I think there's like a theoretical understanding of, of transmission dynamics that make that almost certain to be true, that, that there are um, populations of higher transmission intensity where the epidemic will recede into. And there's kind of a, a notion going around that the end of the epidemic looks a lot like the start of the epidemic in terms of transmission dynamics. The difference compared to the start of the epidemic is that unlike the start of the epidemic, in addition to high risk populations where, 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 where HP transmission can concentrate, there's also this large pool of people with a low probability of being um, viremic but, but spread around that almost creates an, an environmental risk, a small probability of, of, of HIV transmission. And so um, I think inevitably there's that group there, but it's going to be much more difficult to detect now because it's amongst a large number of diffuse transmissions um, that, 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 that I think will continue to be the plurality of new infections for a long time, even though there is that group where prevention like very focused prevention is really essential to get into it's just, it's hard to find. Other questions? Cool. I have a kind of related follow-up to what you all have just been talking about here. So um, Jeff, you were showing this superb maps of where like the balance of prevalence is versus the balance of, of uptake. And that seems to almost be a story of if, if you look at if you imagine like individual risk or something in those areas, this high uptake here is about bringing risk down to a certain level. Over here, there wasn't as much exposure risk because there's a lower prevalence. So we don't need as much uptake to get down to like the same individual risk levels. Have you all looked at, just done like that kind of crude calculation to sort of say, well, is there like a shared target risk level that people seem to have, and so people who are at my exposure risk are much, much more likely to take this up because it gets, that down, gets them down to that desired exposure risk, whereas people who are at lower exposure risk are like, eh, you know, I, I don't need to work as hard at this because I'm already at a low exposure risk and it doesn't take much effort to get me down to, again, the sort of shared rough level. So that, that has certainly been the story of pre-exposure prophylaxis uptake in, in the UK and uh, other settings is that, that there's been very effective um, self-selection of people at high risk to use PrEP. And so the impact of PrEP has perhaps been more than we might have expected in, in those settings. Lee, do you want to talk a bit about how you're conceptualizing that? Um, yeah. So, I mean, a lot of the evidence for PrEP um, shows that people, you know, one of the strongest motivations for, for initiating PrEP is being in a relationship with someone who's either HIV positive or whose HIV status is unknown. Um, so in our modeling, we, we're kind of trying to model that link between having an unknown status partner, HIV positive partner, and um, initiating PrEP. Um, but I think, um, I mean, it's, it's interesting that we have Brian um, on, the, on the meeting here, because I know Brian, 
on Shepherdus Brian with John. Um, in one of your early presentations, you were looking at the link between um, levels of AIDS mortality and sort of the intensity of behavior change and sort of linking the two and saying that, um, you know, in, in settings where there's high AIDS mortality, you would expect to see more behavior change because there's more awareness of HIV. Um, and, um, you know, that's, that, that, that is certainly sort of one theory for, for why we are seeing more change in behavior are there any other questions online? If, if I can ask a, a slightly a slightly frivolous question, I see you were talking. One of you was talking about binge drinking, and I would have thought if you binge drink all the time, you'd be too drunk to infect anybody. And if you binge drink occasionally, it shouldn't really make too much difference. So why is binge drinking so important? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. <laughs> well, Brian said it was a frivolous question, so I assume he knows the answer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so intermediate levels of binge drink, intermediate levels of binging is clearly the key. <laughs> yeah. You have to lose your inhibition, but not so much that you fall over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, I want to thank both of you. We really appreciate you doing this and have a gift. Well done, guys. Great stuff. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us for drinks. Thank you for getting to us. Bye, Nice to see you all. Nice to see you. Be careful out there. Thank you for joining us. Bye. It's a great, nice, good talk. Very good talk. Both presentations are excellent. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Cheers, guys. Thank <laughs> you.